It's another beautiful day for baseball in Los Angeles. And baseball podcast. Josh Schaefer and Blake Harris cover everything Dodgers right here on Inside the Ravine. What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to Inside the Ravine, a Dodgers podcast presented, as always, by Odyssey Sports. Josh Schaefer and Blake Harris with you today. Blake, the Dodgers are rolling. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Josh, because I get to sit back today and listen to you host the show. It's it's a lot less work when you just get to be on this side of things, so I'm looking forward to uh, you leading the way and me riding shotgun. Yeah, put your feet up, sit back, relax, and let's uh, let's talk about how the Dodgers are just really good right now. Um, you know, the team's continued to, to hit the ball well. Uh, they've taken the first two, um, these, these first two games from the D-backs this week um, in pretty emphatic fashion. Uh, baseballs have been flying off of bats and leaving the yard pretty quickly. Um, and they've taken the first two from the D-backs. And, of course, an awesome stat line from Kershaw in a night where uh, kind of didn't seem to have his best stuff either. But you, you take one look at, at the box score and his line, and uh, you start to think that he probably had a really nice night. And in reality, I think if you watch the game, you'd think he probably wasn't really hitting his stride until probably the third or fourth inning. Um, but Kershaw's been shoving. And then this week we've got uh, – uh, everybody's going to be paying attention to Dodgers and Braves this weekend at Dodger Stadium. So kind of a big week, but a little bit of news to get to too. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's going to be a huge weekend coming up. And, yeah, with Kershaw last night, I, I was at the game. And – it just seemed like he was throwing so many balls. Like I kept talking to my buddies going, is something off? Is something wrong with Kershaw? And he looked not himself. But again, like you said, if you look at the box score, I think it's like five innings, one earned run, a couple hits, five strikeouts. You're like, oh, Kershaw had a decent outing. But that just goes to show how much of a goat Clayton Kershaw is. The fact that he sucks and looks horrible. <laughs> But he still can give you five innings. Again, allow one run that was off a home run that barely went over. So, yeah, another Kershaw outing. His ERA is back down to 2.48, which would lead the majors if he qualified. And like you said, the offense has been rolling. Last night, it seems like every single guy in the lineup recorded a hit. I think Chris Taylor had three hits. David Peralta had three hits. Obviously, Mookie and Will Smith hit home runs. Jason Hayward had a couple big plays. So, yeah, everything is rolling right now for the Dodgers. And I think they're officially... I want to say 23 and four in August uh, up until this point. And if they, I think I saw some stat on Twitter where if they win their final two games of the month, it will officially tie a Dodgers franchise record for wins in a month with 25. So we're uh, witnessing probably one of the greatest months in Dodgers history right now. Yeah, they've just been so good. Um, and they just continue, they lose a game and then they go on another win streak. Um, but yeah, Kershaw's line last night, five innings, one earned on three hits. And it was a home run from Corbin Carroll that just made it out five strikeouts. He did walk three guys. Um, he threw 42 balls in the game. Um, so, I mean, definitely not his best stuff, but his strikeouts, uh, or his, uh, sorry, he threw 42 strikes in the game, um, on, on just 79 pitches. So he threw a lot of balls. Um, but again, I, you know, the the performance speaks for itself. And of course the Dodgers have just been absolutely mashing. They win nine one on Tuesday uh, on Monday night against the D backs. D backs came back a little bit, but the Dodgers win seven to four and chase Zach gallon after what I found to be a pretty shocking outing from Zach gallon, six earned runs, three walks, gave up four home runs to the Dodgers in five and a third. Uh, and his ERA is now up to three thirty two. So still, Gallon's been having a great season, but I was a little bit surprised to see the Dodgers jump all over him the way they did a couple of nights ago and hit two first inning bombs. Uh, and then coming into today's game, uh, Ryan Pepio has been back up with the Dodgers. He's looked outstanding um, in the limited action we've seen of him since he's, you know, expected to start the game on the bump tonight. And finally, Blake, I mean, we've been saying this all season, especially right after Pepio got hurt immediately after coming on this show. So I don't know what that says, uh, <laughs> right. but we've been waiting for Pep all season and he's finally here uh, and he's looked good so far. 
Yeah, I mean, when we talked with Pepio at the beginning of the year, back in February or so, we he talked about how he's ready to have a big year because he was going to be that fifth guy in the starting rotation. And I think Dave Roberts even said prior to the season starting, like Pepio has earned the spot and then he gets the freak injury, misses a couple of months. And he was kind of like the forgotten guy. Like no one really remembered Pepio. No one was really thinking about him. But ever since coming back, this dude has been unreal. Granted, it's been two outings, so take it with a slight grain of salt but nine innings he's only allowed two runs 11 strikeouts and one walk and he's looked good I mean he has looked the part he has looked electric he's honestly in my opinion when you think about all the rookies that have come up for the Dodgers this year I think Ryan Pepio has looked the best and this is something that we talked about with Pepio and we talked about you know in a few shows Josh the thing with Ryan Pepio he's a strikeout machine he limits hits he limits home runs his only issue is walks Last year, I mean, I'm looking at his numbers. He was averaging seven walks per nine innings. Still had a really good ear race. Still had a really, really good strikeout rate. But it was the walks. In nine innings, he's only issued one walk. And that just goes to show, when he's not walking, guys, the dude is electric. So I think Ryan Pepio is going to be a massive piece for the Dodgers in October. I think he's probably going to earn himself a spot in the bullpen as maybe a bulk guy or maybe as a reliever because based on the two-game sample size we've seen from him, he looks like one of the best pitchers the Dodgers have. So I'm really happy for him. I'm, I'm glad he's finally able to get this chance because he earned it, you know, in spring training. And now for the stretch run, he could be a crucial, crucial piece for the Dodgers in their rotation and bullpen. Two more quick hits of news that I want to get to, obviously, before we really get going here. But um, I, want, I want to take us back to a, a, a beautiful Octo- or August 24th night in Cleveland. Uh, Michael Bush. First home run in his big league career. Um, didn't watch it live. I turned the game on after it happened because you uh, texted me something with a few expletives. Um, yes. And I was like, I missed it. I walked out of the room, went to the bathroom, was in the bathroom, got that text, came running back out. And uh, good for Mike. Uh, was there at on Monday, got to see him get a hit. Um, so, so good for him. It's been a long time coming. Um, and, uh, the one thing with Bush though, is, you know, I've continued to think like it hasn't really translated for him yet at the big league level. Obviously he's got his home run, you know, he still hasn't really hit his stride yet. The problem with Mike is he's clearly too good for triple a at this point, but Bush, he, he doesn't really ever find his stride because I feel like he's never in the big leagues long enough. You know, it's the same thing of last time, right? When he started to figure it out, he got sent back down, tore it up in triple a with OKC. And then we've been talking for well over a month now. J.D. Martinez just put him on the uh, the I.L. and bring up Michael Bush. They wait so long, and then they bring up Mike. And who knows, maybe they'll send him back down before he even hits a stride. Yeah, I mean, the tough part is, like you said, he's going up and down, and then when he's up... He's not in the lineup every day. He gets a start here, bench the next day, gets a start here. And the numbers still haven't been there. But I will say if there's anything as a good out, he's had a lot of them. I mean, he had a couple in Boston. He had to the warning track. He's had a couple of hard grounders that have just been nice plays defensively. I think he's had a couple of strikeouts where one strikeout was like clearly the wrong call. And then he had another one where it was like a check swing. So yeah, the numbers haven't been there. Small sample size, but... He's been getting really unlucky so far with his results. So, you know, you look at his numbers and he's probably hitting like below 200 is OPS and everything's not that great. But the at-bats I, I've been encouraged by, he hasn't been striking out as much. So hopefully he gets a few more at-bats before either he gets sent down or who knows what the Dodgers do with him. But I, I've liked what I've seen so far. And hopefully, yeah, next year he finally gets runway or maybe they just trade him where he gets, you know, runway somewhere else. Because I, I do think he could be a stud if he actually, you know, gets consistent playing time on a day-to-day basis. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned Boston, so that brings up one last little quick hit here before we take our first break. Um, And that's uh, Mookie Betts' return to Boston. First time he was there, there was a lot of hype around it. His first at-bat didn't go incredibly well, but uh, he ends up having a nice series, um, hits a bomb (laughs) and uh, in his return. And then obviously you get to see a couple of the guys go off. Alex Verdugo, a couple of home runs against the Dodgers. Kike was playing his first game back. It's only been a couple of weeks, but um, it was a fun series to watch. And even in the game, that was a loss. You know, it was an entertaining game. The fact that it was still Mookie's first trip back to Boston since he left still is crazy. But I guess because of the whole, you know, interleague play stuff, it, it never happened. But 
yeah, uh, Red Sox fans, they still clearly love him. They still clearly miss him. And the fact that he absolutely went off was just the icing on the cake. And again, he hits that home run over the monster pretty much to wrap up the weekend. But that was a fun series. I, I do enjoy now having these interleague games more often because I think this was something like I heard the Dodgers like eighth or ninth ever trip to Fenway Park, which is actually insane. So the fact that we're going to get it more often... The Red Sox, although they've been kind of struggling, they played the Dodgers pretty tough. I mean, they were yeah. kind of in it in all those games, and they have some sluggers in their lineup that were really causing issues for the Dodgers. So that was a fun series. I'm glad the Dodgers were able to take two of three, and uh, I'm glad that Mookie finally got that out of the way. I think he said, like, following the series, he was like, yeah, the first game, you know, it was tough. It was great seeing all the fans. But after that, it was just business as of as of late, and I'm actually uh, glad I'm able to move on from that because I love Los Angeles. There's nowhere else I'd rather be, and uh, that's exactly what you want to hear if you're a Dodgers fan from Mookie. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you see Mookie, even in game one, you know, he has the, the return and then the the great ovation from the Red Sox fans. I thought that was so cool. And um, you saw Mookie salute the crowd too. Um, and then yeah. in his first game, he didn't have a great game. He was one for four, a strikeout. Um, meanwhile, Alex Verdugo is making people think that the Red Sox somehow won the trade <laughs> in that first game. Um, yeah. But then after that, I mean, Mookie has multiple – or he has two multi-hit games – um, he had that towering home run, but also was, uh, was cool to see JT and, uh, and Verdugo Homer a couple of times too. Um, so a lot of either current or former Dodgers slash Red Sox in that game or in that series. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it was a fun series to watch. Um, we do have one last thing to touch on here, and this is probably the biggest news of all of them. And it's that we do officially have confirmation that Tony Gonsolin is going to be done for the year. Um, announced uh, a couple of days ago that he will undergo Tommy John surgery. Um, and that's going down on Friday. Yeah, I put it because I, I can't, this whole Tony, Tony Gonsolin time frame has been kind of tough to follow because I couldn't remember if the last time we recorded, if we talk, if he was on like the 60 day IL yet or what was going on with him. But I know officially, yeah, the other day, they said he's even getting Tommy John surgery. We talked about Tony Gonsolin in the last show, the fact that he got absolutely lit up against the Marlins. He's probably going to be out for the season, what's going to happen. But not only is he officially out for the rest of this season, He's likely going to miss all of next season. And Josh, I, I want to know your thoughts on this because I don't know if you've seen like all the quotes and everything that have come out from the aftermath of all this, but it essentially sounds like the Dodgers found out that he had a UCL problem in like May, June, but essentially the team doctor who's going to be, you know, working on the surgery on Friday said, essentially he can't make it any worse. So... If you want to keep using him, keep using him. I guess Tony Gonsolin said, you know, yesterday we were hurting with starting pitching, so I wanted to keep going out there. But this was something that was kind of weird from the Dodgers all season because we knew that Tony Gonsolin was dealing with something. The Dodgers wouldn't tell us what. I guess this all makes sense now. So I just want to know what your thoughts are on the fact that he's been hurt. He knew he needed Tommy John. The Dodgers knew he needed Tommy John, but they just continued to throw him out there every fifth day. And obviously... I think over his last, like, 11 starts, he had, like, an ear rate close to eight. So, clearly it wasn't working, but they were still throwing him into the fire. Yeah, he certainly hasn't been great for the Dodgers uh, this season. You know, overall, you know, an ERA just below five at 4.98 um, with over 100 innings this season. Um, he started out well, um, but then you've seen everything just come crashing down as of late. Over his last 15 games, 6.15 ERA. Over his last seven games, a 7.13 ERA. Like, it just kept getting worse and worse for Tony Gonson. It seemed like you could feel that literally with each start. Um, so definitely not great from Tony. Um, and the quote from Dave, like you mentioned, was kind of like, hey, we're going to keep using them until we can't anymore. And they reached the point where they can't. Yeah, it just took the most home runs allowed by a Dodger starter since, like, Don Sutton in the 70s for them to realize uh, this can't happen anymore. So, I mean, I guess props to Tony Gonsolin for, you know, toughing it out and going out there every fifth day and starting. But, yeah, it it sucks for him. Like, I feel awful for him because now he's going to miss all of next year. I kind of wish the Dodgers just would have shut things down in May when they had an answer and he probably could have returned next year because now next year there's a lot of questions with the Dodgers starting rotation. You know, Gonsolin's out. May's probably going to be out all year. Kershaw might be gone. Julio might be gone. Bueller, he might be 
okay coming back from a second Tommy John. So a lot of question marks with the Dodgers. And I, I, I will say with the Tony Gonsolin thing, I think it's a little interesting how he had some incentives in his contract where if he got to like, tw- I think it was if he got to 20 starts, he like made an extra couple of million dollars. So it's like a little interesting that once he hit that uh, milestone and starts, then he kind of shut things down. But hey, get your money while you can. But yeah, the whole situation kind of sucks. But if there is a silver lining, I guess it's that Tony Gonsolin didn't just completely fall off. Like a lot of people thought, a lot of people thought Tony Gonsolin just sucks now, but it turns out when you need Tommy John surgery and you're pitching, uh, you're not going to do great. So I guess if there's any positive, it's that he sucked because, you know, his arm was a noodle. Yeah. We're going to take a quick break, come back with uh, one of our favorite segments that we like to do on this show, uh, and then coming up later, we've got Q&A. All right, before we get to our uh, one of our favorite segments on this show, there's uh, there's one more piece of news that we do have to talk about, um, and it does not really involve the Dodgers all that much, um, but instead the team out in the OC, and it's that the Angels placed nearly a quarter of their roster on waivers this week, including starting pitcher Lucas Giolito, Relief pitchers Matt Moore, Ronaldo Lopez, and Dominic Leone, and outfielders Hunter Renfro and Randall Grichik. Um, and I think this kind of solidifies what might be one of the worst trade deadlines in recent memory for a single Major League Baseball franchise. It's so good. Like, it, it's so good. When I got the notification yesterday from Passin, because it, you know, it all comes in all caps, breaking the Los Angeles Angels. When I saw it initially, and as I'm reading it, I'm thinking, man, all these guys must have gotten like COVID together and they're in the COVID protocols if that still exists. And then I keep reading, I'm thinking, what? <laughs> like, what exactly are you doing? And apparently, the Angels, by doing this, they save, I think, like seven million bucks. And I guess officially, what the reasoning is when everyone's pretty much put this all together is, it gives them a better uh, draft pick once Shohei leaves. I think it moves them up a couple rounds. So they're doing all this to get a higher draft pick, which I guess you might as well. But yeah, goodness gracious, the Angels, they trade like their two best prospects for Giolito. Don't even have him for a month. Granted, he was horrible, but what just a collapse where you're looking at the Angels, Josh. Five weeks ago, they could have traded Shohei, gotten the greatest package of all time, not done any of these trade deadline deals where they traded all of their prospects away. And right now, they would probably have a top five, top ten farm system in all of baseball. They'd have a lot of salary relief that they wouldn't have needed. And they'd probably have about the same record that they have now. But instead, they did all these moves. It's completely set them back. And what an absolute dumpster fire. But it is hilarious because nobody deserves it more. Yeah, and it's it's really disappointing because who doesn't deserve this as Angels fans? Like, they, they absolutely do not yeah. deserve this. But with Artie Moreno in charge at this point, nothing is surprising. Um, I, we could have an entire show on the shortcomings and the dysfunctional atmosphere of the LA Angels of Anaheim. Um, but we have to move on. What I do want to say, this last piece of news will transition us into our into our segment, um, is the rules revolving around these claims and and, yeah. uh, and the and the waiver claims. Um, yeah. Basically, um, th- Thursday uh, this week, that's when the waiver period or the waiver expiration ends. So teams can place claims on the players um, involved. So those you know those six guys. Um, those players are allowed to be – they are ed- eligible for the postseason. They can play in the playoffs. They obviously won with the Angels. Um, they can play in the postseason for whichever team claims them. And the rule is – or the way that it's going to work is that the team with the worst record on Thursday will be awarded the player who puts in the claim for each guy. So it will go from worst record to best record, and that transitions us into one of our favorite segments – Fair or foul, Blake? We've gone back and forth a couple of times on this. You've hosted a majority of the time. I think I've hosted a few times. And our first fair or foul of today's episode, starting off, is the Dodgers will get a legitimate opportunity to claim any of these players. Is that fair or foul? I, I'm I'm loving that you brought fair or foul back, and I'm loving that this is the first one that you go into because this was something I, I wanted to talk about because it is interesting in regards to the Dodgers. I'm going to go foul 
And it's because I'm looking at it right now. So I guess if you take the Angels out of it, there's 29 teams that can claim these players. And as of right now, the Dodgers have the third best record in baseball. And I think you said, Josh, it's like the record as of tomorrow. So I don't think anything's going to change. Yeah, they're two games up over the Rays. They might be swapping with the Orioles, but 27-28, it doesn't matter. I don't think the Dodgers are going to get anyone, Josh, because... It was interesting learning about the whole waiver system yesterday because what I assumed was I assumed it was kind of like fantasy football style where I figured it goes from worst to last or worst to best. And once you claim a player, you then go all the way to the bottom and that's how it works and you keep moving your way up. But no, if you're like the Oakland A's, if they want to claim all six players, their first dibs, they can claim all six and they get them. So considering the Dodgers are going to be sitting all the way at, I think, yeah, 27, um, I don't think they'll be able to get anyone because Lucas Giolito, although he's been pretty bad since he joined the Angels, he's still a starting pitcher that has been solid in his past. I'm sure a lot of playoff teams are going to want a piece of that. The real uh, piece that I am just hoping there's some miracle, Josh, is Matt Moore, who's the reliever uh, for the Angels. He's been fantastic this season. He's been a really dominant lefty reliever. I don't think he's going to make it back. And then I think there's like Rinaldo Lopez. He'd be a great addition. I don't think he makes it back. Even bats like Hunter Renfro and Randall Grichik. The Dodgers don't necessarily need another outfielder, but once rosters expand in September, they'll have an extra spot. See what you can get out of those guys because those guys have shown they can be great hitters. So yeah, unfortunately, I don't think the Dodgers swoop in on any of them. It'd be great if they do, but yeah, I think every team ahead of them is going to be making claims for all these guys. Now, I, I agree with you. I think I think that's foul, unfortunately, for the Dodgers and for Dodgers fans, especially when we had talked about Lucas Giolito um, potentially being acquired at the deadline and it didn't work out. It seems like the teams that are primed to potentially land some of these guys aren't the ones at the bottom of the standings, but then the, the teams that are kind of in the hunt at the moment. Because, again, you know, you, you have to keep in mind, like, if you're a team at the bottom of the standings, are you going to take on a big contract if it's a guy who's going to be gone? very quickly after so maybe you let those guys go if you don't think you have a legitimate chance of re-signing them or they're not worth signing or they're not worth paying but the teams that are kind of in the hunt right now boston minnesota arizona san francisco chicago miami um the padres are kind of in there i don't know if that would really happen preller is preller is going to sign one of them one of these guys is going to end up on the padres somehow can they afford it though can they really afford it it? doesn't i don't think they can (laughs) he'll do it he'll do it just to mess with teams intentionally i wouldn't put it past him (laughs) but you know like you said there's there's so many playoff teams that just because now everyone's in the hunt essentially anyone anyone can use a reliever anyone can use a star anyone can use a bat so it sucks. It should. It should. You know what they should do, Josh? It should be like how we do in our fantasy football league with Fab, a blind auction. <laughs> you're given money and you just blindly bid against everyone. That way, the highest bidder wins. If if the Dodgers want to pay seven million for Lucas Giolito when the next closest bidder is two million, well, the Dodgers get him. They might have to overpay, but they get him. That's how it should be, and that's what they should bargain for in the next uh, next players meeting. Hey, I'm all for it. So we both say foul for this one. The Dodgers aren't going to get any of these guys. Um, Next up, if both Ronald Acuna Jr. and Mookie Betts continue at their current pace, Mookie Betts wins most valuable player. Fair or foul? Well, it should be fair. Whether or not the uh, media on the East Coast wants to agree with me, that remains up for discussion. I think as of right now, I haven't checked today. I know yesterday Ronald Acuna was the betting favorite. The day before, it was Mookie Betts. At this point, it's absolutely ridiculous that Mookie isn't the runaway favorite because he essentially clears Ronald Acuna in every major stat except for batting average. And I know that batting average isn't, you know, what it used to be, but home runs, RBIs, slugging, on base percentage, uh, WRC plus, OPS, OPS plus, every one of these advanced statistics imaginable, he clears except for stolen bases. I, I get that Ronald Acuna is stealing bases like no one ever has before, and he's hitting home runs like no one ever has before, but the it's easier to steal bases now than it has been in years past. And like I mentioned, Mookie clears them in every category, not to mention, Josh, probably the most important thing is that Mookie is doing this while being probably the greatest utility player we've ever seen. He's spending half of his time in right field, <laughs> half of his time at second base. I think he's played about 10 games at shortstop. You can't just ignore that, what he's been doing on you know on the field so 
It should be Mookie Betts, barring Ronald Acuna just absolutely taken off and Mookie kind of falling off, because if the numbers kind of stay where they are right now, I, I don't know how you can give it to Ronald Acuna. I think as of right now as well, Mookie has his war, I think is like one win higher than Acuna's as well, or somewhere close to that. So the advanced numbers, however they calculate war, it shows that Mookie has been by far the more valuable player as well. So that remains to be seen. Yeah, well, we'll see. Um, I think he can probably get to, what, 40, 44, 43 home runs maybe? I think that's a possibility. I'm going to go fair because yeah. I think that, I mean, it was a big story a couple days ago when the odds did come out and it was Mookie over Acuna. Of course, I just pulled one up from yes, from yesterday that has Acuna, the odds on favor to win. So, you know, it seems to change all the time, but I think it's fair. I think based off of what we've seen recently, if these trends continue, I think Mookie wins MVP. Yeah, um, and I think one final thing as well, Josh, I think yeah, I saw some stat as well where Mookie's on pace to set the MLB record for most homers out of the leadoff spot as well. No leadoff hitter, I think, has ever hit 40 home runs, so if he does that, he'll be the first to ever do that. So, again, stolen bases, those are uh, those are nice and all. Also, Josh, really quickly, I just got up the war on my phone. Mookie's is 7.5, Ronald Acuna's 6.5. Like, it's a whole one better. That. that Yes, Josh, your Arizona State math is right. Yeah. <laughs> I, yes. There you go. Our last fair or foul for today. Blake, the Dodgers have started to surge in the power rankings, obviously, as they should. They're 23 and 4 in the month of August. But we've talked all year about how the Dodgers were kind of flying under the radar, just a little bit because of some of these other teams that have been so good. Fair or foul? The Dodgers now getting the hype that they deserve is great for their postseason. That's that's a good one. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say fair, just because although they're 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 finally getting the hype they deserve, they're not being talked about like the way that people are talking about the Braves team. Everyone's talking about this Braves team as if they're like the best team we've ever seen. This is the best team in all of baseball. And the Dodgers are kind of just sitting back going, all right, that that's fine. The Dodgers, for you know, as good as the Braves are, are only four games back. It feels like it should be a lot more than that. Obviously, there's a big series coming up this weekend. Things can change there. But I think I think the Dodgers, this whole kind of like underdog, gritty, veteran team, I think it's going to help them in the playoffs. And they don't have to worry about being the 111-win team that is World Series or bust. Because I think for the Dodgers now, everyone's going to be looking at the Braves as they're the team to beat. Not the Dodgers, so f I, I think that actually is going to really help them. Yeah, you know, I th obviously whether or not there's hype doesn't impact whether or not the team actually wins in the postseason. It's just that every year the Dodgers' expectations have been so high, and all year I've been saying, I like that people aren't talking about them, but they probably should be. And now we're getting to the point where people are talking about them. But you're right, I, I'll go fair as well. A lot of agreements today, Blake. Um, that, you know, it's good. I like that where they're at right now. I like the attention that they're getting, but at the same time, it doesn't seem to be at the height of the Braves. Of course, that could all change this weekend if the Dodgers take the entire series. It, whether they win the series or not, if they sweep the Braves this weekend, I think that that changes. I don't think that's going to happen, but it's a possibility. My last thing, I said three over the last one because I kind of I didn't write this last one down, um, but I, I do have one more fair foul for you. So our last one before we take our next break, Dave Roberts is National League Manager of the Year. Fair. Oh, uh, this is the easiest one so far, Josh. This is fair. We talked about it, I think, on the last episode. The job that he's done this year has been unreal. I mean, all the players they lost to uh, free agency in the offseason, all the guys that have spent time on the injured list this year, the expectations surrounding them being a potential 80-85 win team, the fact that they're on pace to win 100 games, uh, it, it's an unreal job. And I don't think really there have been any other managers that have really – earned or put themselves in the running to be manager of the year maybe like skip schumacher of the marlins but if they don't make the playoffs he won't make it uh i don't know who the reds manager is off the top of my head but maybe if they get like the top wild card maybe him but yeah it, it should be dave roberts i think he's the easy easy pick but again do the voting committee agree that remains to be seen see i agree as well and you know what you and i have had some critiques of dave in the past but i think the overall consensus with Dave is that he's been good for the Dodgers. He's been a good manager for the Dodgers, but then the, the biggest knock has been like, I feel like I could manage that team to a hundred wins. I could manage yeah. that team <laughs> in the playoffs. Right. 
we've gotten to the point, especially this season is the perfect example of why Dave has been terrific for the Dodgers and people should change yeah. their opinions on how he's been the last few years, especially just based off of this season is Dave is having more success this year. The Dodgers are having more success with less than they've had in recent years. Meanwhile, you look at their high payroll, especially the players that they've had these last couple of years, the hype surrounding those teams, like they should win all of those games. Look at Bob Melvin with the Padres. Look at Aaron Boone with the Yankees. I mean, yeah. these teams are atrocious. They, they have had these egregious seasons. Some of, like the Padres hype was World Series or bust. They're not going to make the playoffs. Like the Yankees have been terrible as well. Like I, I saw something last week or the week before people were like, hey, the Yankees didn't lose today because they didn't play. Like <laughs> it, that's how these teams have been lately. And you look at their payroll, you look at the guys on the roster, you look at how good some of these teams should be and it ain't happening, man. And yeah. meanwhile, Dave has not saying the Dodgers are some team full of slouches and this team full of like all these no name, random guys, like the giants were a couple of years ago when they were absolutely nasty and you hadn't heard of half the guys on the team. Like, obviously everybody knows who all these guys on the team are, but the hype was not around them this year. He's had to deal with all these injuries, and I think Dave's done a great job. So I agree. Yeah. I think fair. I think this year completely writes the ship with Dave as well. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully he gets that. Josh, before I take a quick break, I do have some breaking news for you. Ooh, the let's Dodgers, hear it. the Dodgers have made a move. Oh, and they have signed catcher Tucker Barnhart to a minor wow. league deal. <laughs> there you go. Sick. Well, there you go. <laughs> Breaking news right here on Inside the Ravine as Tucker Barnhart uh, signs a minor league deal with the Dodgers. Uh, this season, he was uh, hitting a mere 202 for the Cubs mm -hmm. um, with one home run across 44 games. He's All got right. better numbers than Austin Barnes, though. Yes. <laughs> yes, he does. Hey, one home run for each of them, though. There you so. go. <laughs> We'll take our last break, come back, and wrap up the show with a little bit of Q&A after this. All right, we are back, and I'm taking Josh's job now because his hosting was so weak. So we have to uh, flip things over, but no. Josh we is graciously I was going to hand it off to you, but then yeah, I, I was... take a sip of water and you just jump <laughs> right in. Josh has graciously allowed me to take over the Q&A. I couldn't let him host the entire show because that's not how we run things here at Inside the Ravine. So, Josh, I turned to Twitter. It's been a while since we've done a Q&A to wrap up the show. And as always, if you guys have any questions you'd like to ask us on future episodes, make sure to follow us on Twitter at Inside the Ravine. Usually about an hour or so before we record, I'll post out saying hit us up with your questions. Josh, we got a good amount, so let's try to kind of go through these because I want to get to try to I want to try to get to every question we can. So we'll go We're through rapid fire. these rapid fire. Uh, our first one it comes from I speak for everyone. Will the Dodgers win more than a regular season championship this year? We all know they won't, but would but would to see the breakdown. I think they might have forgotten a word there. So, Josh, do the Dodgers just walk away with their regular season championship or do you think as of right now they can go all the way? See, I've been saying this for a long time this season, really since the All-Star break. Uh, this team feels different to me. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that they're going to win anything. Um, but, yeah, obviously I think at this point we know they're going to win the National League West. They should go in as a relatively high seed. If not, you know, if in, un, unless they overtake the Braves in the NL and somehow end up as the number one seed. But, um, look, the team does feel different to me. They feel a lot more co cohesive than they have in the past. Um, I, I have faith with in the team with where they're at right now, obviously things could change in a couple of weeks, but I think the Dodgers are entirely possible of winning the national league pennant. And I think that they have a legitimate chance to win the whole thing this year. Yeah. Just like fair or foul. I completely agree with everything Josh said. Uh, this next one comes from Waterboy grant pre UCL injury. I felt very comfortable moving off of Julio and paying Otani a stupid contract. But now I feel like Julio is more of a priority to re-sign. How do you think the Dodgers approach the offseason pitching-wise? Josh, yeah, that's something we didn't even talk about earlier in the show as well because this happened uh, in the last week or so is that the whole Shohei thing happened. So I guess a two-parter, Josh. One could be just where are you now on the whole Shohei thing in regards to potentially giving him one of those fat contracts considering he might pitch. And I guess, yeah, how does that now impact... What do you think the Dodgers should do this offseason when it comes to their uh, starting pitching? 
I think that's a really, really good question um, because Julio is somebody that has been a little inconsistent this year. And I think in the back of my mind, I was thinking, all right, Julio's gone. Use some of those uh, available funds to give Shohei an outrageous contract. Now, Julio has really started to figure it out. And then you've also got Shohei, who is now no longer pitching for the rest of the year. I I, I really don't know what to expect with Shohei. I would be a lot more open to, to making Julio Urias a priority for the Dodgers. Um, but the thing is, is, Shohei is Shohei. At some point, the guy is going to pitch again, and I'm sure he's going to be very good. But also, the things that this guy just brings to a baseball team and to a franchise – just can't be replicated by anybody else in baseball. I completely understand not wanting to give the guy an outrageous contract based off of the current situation with his health. Um, I totally understand that. He is still deserving of a large contract. I would not even be surprised to see him sign a much shorter deal and try again next year or the year after. I think that that's a legitimate possibility. I I don't think that that was something that was going to happen. I had no expectation for that to happen. With regardless, regardless of who signs him, I didn't think that was going to be a possibility. I think it now is, but at least for the Dodgers, I think that you now have that conversation. Do we make Julio Urias a priority, or do we still make a good offer to Shohei Otani? I think they absolutely should do both. If they can, yeah. I don't know if that's entirely plausible, but they should. Yeah. It's going to be interesting because, again, we don't know as of right now what the you know the final call is on Shohei, if he's going to need Tommy John surgery, if he's going to avoid surgery, if he's going to be pitching next year. But I agree, if if Shohei's not pitching, then all of a sudden, yeah, you you got to make Julio your number one priority because I, I mentioned it when we were talking about Tony Gonsolin. As of right now, the, the only thing set in stone in the 2024 rotation is Walker Bueller and I guess Bobby Miller, and that's really it. So you're going to need pitching. What's Julio going to get contract wise? I don't know. I it depends on the price because I I don't want to overpay for him, but you might have to because the the pitching market this soft season, it's not that great. It's like Julio, Blake Snell, and it really kind of carries off after that. So again, it all comes down to Shohei. But like you said, Josh, figure out a way to get both. Maybe you can sign Julio long term. Maybe Shohei wants to sign a shorter term deal and then enter free agency in a couple years, maybe offer him like that Bryce Harper contract the Dodgers did a couple years back. I think they offered him like four years for 180. Offer that to Shohei and see what happens. But yeah, Julio, uh, I think they definitely need to bring him back a little more than they did a couple weeks ago. Uh, Magic Skywater, who is the most important player for the Dodgers in the month of September? Uh, I think it's Mookie Betts. I think he's been their most important player all season. Uh, So I think that he's going to be their most important player um, in September. I think he kind of has to be. Um, He's your leadoff guy. He's the heart and soul of the team. um, And he's in the MVP race. So, of course, him winning the MVP isn't, I think, a priority. But I think it's a legitimate possibility. And you need him to keep that pace if you want to continue having success. I'm going to give it to two guys. I'm going to kind of split it down the middle. And that's going to be Bobby Miller and Ryan Pepio, because I think in the month of September, you're going to need to see what these guys have when it comes to starting games and potentially what they can offer you as bullpen pieces. Because I think there's a question later on coming about like what's your ideal starting rotation for October, something like that. You got to see if Bobby Miller, if you can count on him in October, or see if you can count on Ryan Pepio to give you innings in October. So between those two rookies, I think they got to show in September and show that they're uh, they're capable of you know being guys you can rely on uh, in the starting rotation or potentially later in the bullpen. I'm going to go to that question now, Josh, because it comes from Oscar Diaz. Who will be the starting four slash five for the postseason? And part two, will Walker Bueller be healthy enough to give them innings in October? Um, My guess is no for Walker Bueller. I mean, I think it's a possibility, but I wonder if you make that a priority or not. Um, in, in regards to the rotation, I think, you know, it's Kershaw, it's Julio, it's Bobby Miller. Um, and then obviously now you've got no more Gonsolin. Um, at this point, you know, I think Pepio is a guy that's probably going to be out of the bullpen in the postseason. I feel like that's the most reasonable thing for the Dodgers to do here um, because – I think that he just brings a lot more 
Um, so I, I think obviously it's Lance Lynn. Like that's that's where I'm going. Pepio's in the bullpen. So Kershaw, uh, Julio, Bobby Miller, and Lance Lynn, I think is my is my top four there. And then, you know, if there is yeah. somebody else, you know, if there's somebody else than Pepio, but also I think that at least for if if you need to have somebody else go, then maybe it's not Pepio, and maybe you have somebody open, and then you go straight to a guy like Ryan Yarbrough and have a have a long reliever. It's going to be interesting. So I, I Kershaw and Julio, those are the two guarantees. But things are going to get kind of interesting, Josh, because I'm looking right now at the NLDS schedule. Assuming again the the Dodgers are playing in the NLDS, they don't end up in the wild card. But game one would be Monday, October 9th. Game two would be Wednesday, October 11th. And then, well, actually, hold on. It's it's all mixed up here. Wait, oh, here we go. Okay, no, scratch that. Game one for the NLDS would be Saturday, October 7th. Game two for the NLDS would be Monday, October 9th. Game three would be Wednesday, October 11th. And then game four would be October 12th. And then game five, October 14th. For those first three games, you're having every other day off if the Dodgers want they can stretch out guys I don't know if they will but they can maybe go with a three-man rotation go with Kershaw go with Julio go with Lance Lynn because by the time game three or four rolls around whoever starts game one is going to be on normal rest so if you want to bring him back on normal rest you can and then all of a sudden this actually expands your bullpen a little more so I think Lance Lynn is probably going to be the number three and then with Bobby Miller maybe they opt to use him as a you know a piggyback guy in October maybe if Julio only goes four innings bring out Bobby Miller to give you three I think with having all these off days it gives the Dodgers a chance to do that and again you make your bullpen deeper and you save these starting arms will they do that I'm not so sure but I I think it's something they could potentially do and again with uh, Ryan Pepio as well and Ryan Yarbrough so all of a sudden that's three guys that can give you four to five innings out of the bullpen and really really save some guys so it, it could get interesting. I don't know if they do that. In regards to Walker Buehler, what is it, August 30th? I think he's still throwing. I don't think he started a rehab assignment. I think the latest Dave said was they still expect him to be back in September. But he's running out of time, Josh. He's running out of time. I don't think. I think if two weeks from now, if Buehler hasn't started a rehab assignment, I don't think we're going to see him. So I'm, I'm going to give him two weeks to a start a rehab assignment. Uh, if not, well... At least there's next year. Yeah. I don't want to rush him back, so at least there's next year. Uh, question from Michael. How do you think this Dodgers team stacks up against our teams of the last five to six years? Well, I'll say first and foremost, last year was one of the best teams I've ever seen in my life from any team, um, which is why they will forever be one of the best teams to never win right up there with the Mariners. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I absolutely think last year was one of the best, you know, I've ever seen. They were some of the most fun games to watch, um, and they were a really fun team. And then the 2017 team was a lot of fun too, just because, I mean, first of all, I will say this. I have looked back at some of those rosters recently um, and have gone through some of those seasons. And I think in my head and in my memory, I remember that team being even better than they were. Obviously, they were a great team should have won the world series in 2017. They deserved it. Um, but I feel like they weren't as good as I thought they were. Like they, th- those 2017 teams were not nearly as good as the team that we saw last year. Um, but this year's team is different because I love the personalities that you have on the team. Bringing in Ahmed Rosario and Kike Hernandez just makes it a billion times better, but the team is so fun. They've got, you know, some veterans, they've got the rookies that are all mixed in. And this team is just genuinely so much fun to watch, especially when they're winning, obviously. But like earlier in the season when the bullpen was blowing games, I mean, it was difficult to, to watch and they weren't very fun um, on some nights. But the, the way that the team has played since the trade, since before the trade deadline and the personalities that they have on the team, they've just been a lot of fun to watch. So um They've had some good, fun teams in recent years. 2017 was great. Last year, in terms of winning, was the best I've ever seen. This team's up there, though, and that's why I'm, you know, I'm hesitant to say what I think they're capable of, but I do think they are capable of going all the way. Yeah, I mean, 
Best team, no. But when you talk about just like the experience as a whole, 2017, that was a team where it just felt like no matter what, they were going to win on any given night. Obviously, the 2020 team, just because they won it all, like you're kind of more attached to all the guys on the team. But something about this this team this year, Josh, I don't know what it is. And I, I will say, I was at the game last night. It was actually my first game I've gone to as a fan this year. All the other games I've gone to this year, I've been in the press box I've been covering. Doing the uh, Freddy dance after every you know extra base hit with the entire stadium doing it, it is an absolute blast. And I can tell that it's just a different feel. We ta- I, I said this last time. We talked about this last year. Last year's team, although they were winning every game, they're one of the best ever, they had no energy. There was just nothing. They were just showing up. They were doing their business. This team this year, everyone is getting into it. Every personality is completely different. Dave Roberts has literally said this is the favorite team he's ever managed. And I I absolutely love this Dodgers team, which is crazy because entering the season, Josh, with how many guys we lost last year, losing Cody, losing Justin Turner, losing Trey Turner, I wasn't as excited about this season as I've been in years past because it was a completely new look team. But what we've seen over the last month, how this team has come together, this is probably one of my favorite teams, at least that I can remember in recent memory. So while again, on paper or results wise, they might not be the best we've seen. I think over the last five to six years, when you take sentimental value out of the 2020 team, this might be my favorite Dodgers team that we've gotten the last five to six years. And yeah, I, th- I, I think all the stuff, as I've talked about before, we've talked about, I think this is going to carry over into October. I, I think this is going to help them, and I think this is going to be what helps the Dodgers make a push. We'll we'll, uh, we'll have to wait and see, but that wraps no up pressure. the Q&A, Josh. There's no, yeah, again, there's no pressure. Again, the, unless they, sweep, so nice unless they sweep the Braves. I mean, even as somebody who watches the team so frequently and who follows the team so closely, there's been no pressure watching these games. Like, and it's even more now that they're winning, but, like, it's just, like, the pressure of being – the favorites every single year just does not, it does not seem to be there in the clubhouse, which I think is so important going into the postseason. And the guys are all on record of saying that exact same thing. 100%. 100%, Josh. I'll let you wrap this one up though for us. All right. I wasn't sure. Well, uh, that's going to do it for this episode of Inside the Ravine. Of course, the return of fair or foul. Um, and, uh, again, keep sending us those questions whenever we fire out that tweet, um, love, you know, talking with you guys and getting the responses on social media and also hearing what you guys have to say, um, and responding to your questions. So make sure you follow us on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok at inside the ravine. Blake is over at Blake Harris, TBLA. Yeah. No, no dog. It's not, it's not the. I thought it was still Blake Harris. Oh, bro, we changed that like six months ago or something. Keeping keeping blue, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Josh. What is it? What what is it now? Is it not? Is it not? Okay, hold on. No, we're gonna sit here. Josh doesn't even know your hand. Hey, man, I know you changed your handle to Josh Schaefer PXP. I stay up to date on this kind of stuff. I did change it. I'm I'm at Josh Schaefer PXP. There you go. See. Yeah. See, because you used to have... I'm going to expose you here. You used to have two Twitter accounts. Yeah, I still do. So, But I thought the other (laughs) one was Blake H. Harris. It was, but I switched it months and months ago to this one, Blake Harris. And the other one, I think I threw uh, Harris Highlights or something like that for that one. So the old one still exists, Uh, but the new main one is is now officially Blake H. Harris. So we're not... We're still not doing... It's not Blake, Blake Harris thinking Blue L.A. anymore. No. No, no, no. no. Blake That's H. Tough. Harris. Blake H. Harris, which is what it is on other sites as well. Go look for Blake. It's easy, Blake yeah. H. Find Harris. me there. Yeah. Yes. Blake Howard. Um, Howard. I know. I wasn't going to say it, though. Uh, I don't want to expose you like that, Hoherd. Um, oh, there it is. Blake H. Harris on Twitter. Uh, I'm at Josh A. for PXP. And of course, you can follow the show on whatever social media you guys use Twitter, X, whatever it's called. Um, at Inside the Ravine. And again, keep shooting us questions um and uh we're happy to answer those and uh have a great week looking forward to this week's braves dodgers series and uh hoping to watch some of those games with you guys along the way have a great rest of your week wherever you may be